Um, so here we go. So welcome to ESM 3234 Fluid Mechanics 1 Control Volumes for Fall 2020. Really excited um, to be teaching this class. I haven't taught it since 2013, so seven years. Um, and one thing that's different about teaching it this time around is that most of you are now biomedical engineers, whereas in the past it was mostly ESM majors um, and some ME majors. So let me begin sharing my screen. Okay, can you just let me know, are you seeing this um, slide, PowerPoint slide? It's just got the name of the course. Yeah, okay. Yep, I can see it. Thank you very much. Okay, and sorry, I'm gonna have to check the chats every time a little message pops up. Okay, so here we are. Um, up in the left-hand corner, you can see the cover of the textbook that we're using. It's Munson, Young, and Okishi's Fluid Mechanics 8th Edition. Great textbook. Uh, most of my colleagues across um, you know, schools, across universities who teach fluid mechanics um, use this one. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, if you watched my intro video, my welcome video, you know a little bit. Um, I just want to talk more about my academic background. So my degrees are in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, and I've been at Virginia Tech since 2008 and very happy. It's really lovely to be down here with the wonderful weather. Um, and then my partner in this class, the TA, is Hyun Gong Park. And um, he studies fluid dynamics as well. We both do. It's what we do for a living. So you're dealing with uh, people who are pretty knowledgeable. He studies uh, rain droplet impact on plant pathogens with uh, Jonathan Bareko, who's an ME professor. Used to be in BEAM, now is an ME. Um, so just a little bit more about my research. Uh, BEAM recently did a lab promo featuring my lab. So just a couple minutes. Can you see and hear the video? So you may know that can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see and hear the video are under threat from rising ocean temperatures. Yes, we can see it. What about ocean flows over reefs, but we still don't have an understanding of how the flow behaves inside a reef because we're not able to see inside reefs or take measurements. So we're doing some of the first computations of the ocean flow through a coral reef, and that should help us to formulate some effective interventions for corals. One of the guiding principles in our lab is bioinspiration. So that means if there's an engineering problem involving fluid dynamics that we would like to solve, we can look to nature and say, okay, well, what kind of solutions has nature come up with for this problem? Let's try and learn from insects, see how they're doing things. Maybe we can do things a little bit better as well. It gives us a better understanding of how creatures like insects can accomplish things that, that we can accomplish, especially in terms of perceiving the world around us. Understanding these kinds of systems really lets us use the approaches that they've developed. One of the things we're hoping that my work will do is lead to the development of better, more precise hearing aids in the long run. Students will leave this lab uh, with a strong computational foundation. They'll be able to think about a scientific problem and formulate hypotheses. They'll learn communication skills, how to explain their research to others in a way that's compelling and makes sense. All right, so that's a little bit about um, my lab. And then I wanted to show you a little bit of Hyungan's research too. Oh, and then I've, um, a new research direction for me is uh, physics informed machine learning, which is really just sort of taking over all sort of engineering fields, right? This wonderful power that machines have to sort of learn automatically faster than humans. Just a moment. So that's a new research direction for me. And then Hyung Gan, um, this is a nice video from his research. And this is actually um, about um, plant pathogens interacting with water droplets, with rain droplets. So I don't know about you, but I could just watch that all day. <laughs> but one thing that I want you to notice that we're going to talk about in a little while when we talk about coronavirus um, is droplet size. 
So here we've got raindrops impacting a leaf. And you can see that when the raindrop breaks up, it breaks up into really large size droplets and then some really small droplets. And so this is similar to what we talk about when we talk about whether the coronavirus is airborne, whether we're dealing with droplets, which fall to the ground quickly, or aerosols, which can float through the air and be suspended for several hours. So sort of have this picture in mind where you see some large droplets and then some much smaller ones. You can see the large ones are already starting to fall back down toward the leaf, whereas the smaller ones, the aerosols, just go up and get suspended in the air. Okay, and now about you. So um, as I said before, most of you are actually biomedical engineering majors. So 39 of 74, actually as of this morning, it's 75. Um, and then the next biggest group is ESM majors, 27. We've got a handful of general engineering majors, two material science majors, two ME and one physics major. So welcome, really thrilled to have you all here. Um, one thing that's going to be different, as I mentioned before, is I'm going to try and work in a lot of examples that are relevant to biomedical engineering, which is not something that I did a lot in the past. Okay, so fluid dynamics is incredibly relevant for reasons I mentioned in my welcome video, right? You know, most of the stuff around us is made of fluids, not solids, right? So liquids are fluids, gases are fluids. So if you think about where we live, in the large scale, the atmosphere and the, you know, Earth's mantle and uh, rivers, oceans, etc. you know, what we have in this sphere within the Earth's atmosphere, you know, the minority of matter is in the solid state there. So, you know, fluids is pretty important. It describes uh, most stuff we're dealing with. Uh, and particularly now, um, with this national conversation about coronavirus in the midst of a pandemic, um, I wanted to show share with you a little bit about um, coronavirus fluid dynamics. So this is just a fantastic GIF um, done by a really talented illustrator named Eleanor Lutz. And what she's done is just made this GIF of all the different interconnected fluid dynamics processes that happen when someone's on a ventilator, right? So here you see the lungs filling with air, right? And of course there's fluid dynamics involved there, right? Because air is a gas, it's a fluid, right? But how do we drive our respiration while well, our diaphragm um, contracts and pulls down and the space in our lungs um, increases that lowers the pressure in our lungs and air rushes in, right? And then of course, as you know, we have air going down the generations of the bronchial tree until it gets to the alveoli and then the oxygen diffuses across um, the capillaries into the bloodstream. Uh, and then down here, we've got a very simple representation of a closed circuit ventilator. Ones that are used in hospitals are, are more complex than this, but you can see that the basic principle used here is, is the same as the lung, right? It's the same up here the ventilator that they're showing up here and down here, it's the same principle though, right? You have a volume and you're contract compressing the volume and increasing pressure, and then you're expanding the volume, decreasing pressure and driving a flow in that way. Um, so when we think about coronavirus, which we don't wanna have to do more than necessary, you know, just, just realize how important fluid dynamics is um, in this pandemic. And then we have another video to show you, and we're going to do a little think, pair, share. I'm going to try out uh, breakout rooms. Um, and so, but first we're going to watch this video, and it's another fluid dynamics phenomenon that's related to the coronavirus. And uh, as you're watching this video, I want you to try to identify, just notice three things about it. They can be anything. Just as you watch it, just try and observe three things, make three observations. After we do that, I'll put you in breakout rooms. You can trade observations with your partner in the breakout room. You know, what did you notice? And then you can sort of narrow in on the things that you both notice, and then we'll come back together. And hopefully a few people will be brave enough to share, you know, what they thought were the significant things. Keep in mind as you're thinking about it, 
you know, what are some of the national debates that are going on about um, how to mitigate the spread of coronavirus? All right, so for the think part, going back to Twitter to watch another wonderful fluid dynamics um, video. This time it's a simulation. All right. So. Okay, I'm going to pause the simulation there and we're going to go into our breakout rooms. I think I have to stop share to do that. Okay. More breakout rooms. And we're going to shoot for um, two participants a room, but we'll see. Might be three. OK, here we go. So just go ahead and join those rooms as the invitation pops up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I wonder too. Um, yeah, so I. Hello. Hi. Don't mind me. I'm just uh, exploring breakout rooms. I didn't realize I could hop in here. Uh, we were just talking about how we were noticing the fluid with the arm covering just not going as far. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's really the, the sort of key thing about that simulation. It's such a wonderful simulation because it just lays it out so clearly. Uh, All right, I'm going to hop back to the main room.
uh, Professor. Uh, you, did. you did. Thank you. All right, 20 seconds until everybody's out of their breakout room. And then we'll start our share part of the discussion. Okay. So everybody is back now from the breakout rooms. Um, and I just want to open up the floor now and see if anyone is willing to share what they talked about, what some of the main observations were that you talked about in your, in your small groups. Um, can I say something? Yes, please do. Um, so um, we were talking about like um, how the sneeze, like this, uh, let's call it the smoke, uh, travel, uh, and uh, definitely in the uh, second case, uh, the velocity was uh, after like hitting the hand was uh, lesser than the uh, first case in which you were not covering your face. But also something which happened was that the particles after traveling certain distance, they stop. Mm -hmm. And that might happen because the particles collided with hand and there was an imperfect collision which caused the particles to roll. And then basically you have like a screen and particles aren't traveling anymore. Yeah. And, that that's exactly right. Um, does anyone else want to add to that observation? I can add something. Thank you. Go ahead. So we noticed that, yes, the uh, range was reduced due to the lower velocity, but we also noticed a wider spread area due to how the uh, sneeze impacted with the elbow, making it so that it covered a larger area. But thanks to the reduced velocity and it eventually stopping, it did not reach the other the other entity in the simulation. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great observation as well. Yeah, and that's actually something that hadn't you know really jumped out at me when I watched the video. But you're right. Of course, the plume widens uh, as it slows down. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else want to add something? Another observation other than the fact that, you know, the plume, the sneeze didn't go as far when the person coughed into their elbow um, and the, the sneeze sort of spread out as it decelerated. Any other interesting observations? Inside the animation, there was white particles and green particles. Were there any difference of those, or was that different densities of how many particles, or what was the difference between those? That's a good question. You know, I didn't notice uh, white and green particles. I noticed a big white too, which is vorticity, and I noticed yellow particles. Um, but, you know, it's possible that it's just showing up differently on my screen. But what I'm seeing are, are actual things that look like tubes, sort of like sausages that are white on my screen. And that's a vorticity isocontour. So that means that's a surface where the vorticity has the same value everywhere on that surface. Um, and then the yellow are particles. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other interesting observations, you know, maybe relating it back to sort of conversations that are happening nationally now about disease spread? Um, our group kind of talked, or my group talked about you know, 
while we can have like a facial covering, it still may be necessary to have a facial covering and maintain social distancing since the facial covering might impede like the particles from going as far of a range, but there's still a significant range um, even with some kind of covering around the face. And we thought it'd be interesting if there was a, like simulations that looked at more of like a sealed off um, op obstacle instead of just like an elbow but like an actual mask that can like you know seal around the face how that would influence the particles dispersing yeah that, that's another really great observation and there have been simulations like that but they don't have these really wonderful you know 3d simulations like like this one has but yeah really good observation um, there as well right so some depending on the type of mask you have Right. If you have an N95 mask, you know, a medical grade mask that's well fitted, um, it should contain the entire sneeze. But if you're wearing a surgical mask or a cloth mask, there's probably some escaping. Right. And I think, you know, the one thing that really struck me about seeing the simulation is it really drives home the point how cloth masks and surgical masks are more for others than for you. Right. <laughs> right. It's really about like this very sort of brute force trying to stop the sneeze, stop the particles from spreading as far as they would without a mask, right? Um, but obviously there's lots of leakage around the sides. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna go back to screen sharing. Um, and we'll talk about one more. There's another amazing animation uh, about the physics of N95 masks. So just in case you don't know, um, right, there's basically two types of masks you can wear, uh, which I just mentioned. You know, one type is sort of not tightly fitted. So that's a surgical mask or just a regular cloth mask. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, there's gaps around the sides and that's really just to sort of serve as a blocker. <laughs> So that when you sneeze, cough, or talk, because you're emitting aerosols when you talk as well, it just doesn't travel as far, right? But you still need to practice social distancing with those masks. Um, and then there are medical grade masks, um, which are actually sealed around the mouth. So here is an amazing video talking about the physics of these masks, and it's probably not what you think. Just a touch of fluid dynamics in here, but it's a really terrific video anyway. Prior to March 2020, there's a good chance you didn't know what an N95 mask was, or at least didn't think about them unless you were doing a home repair project with lots of dust, or live in a part of the world with crazy pollution or wildfire. Really good at filtering both the largest and smallest small particles. It's medium-sized small particles that are hardest for it to block. This isn't at all like a strainer, because N95s are much cleverer than strainers. The overarching goal of an N95 mask is instead to get an airborne particle to touch a fiber in the mask. Regardless of how big an airborne particle is, once it touches a fiber, it stays stuck to it and doesn't become airborne again. This isn't anything special about the fibers, but about the size of the particles. At a microscopic scale, everything is sticky, because the weakly attractive force between molecules is more than strong enough to hold very, very small things in place. So you shouldn't think of N95 masks like a fine window screen that keeps insects of a certain size out. You should think of them more like a sticky spider web that can catch an insect of any size as long as it touches a strand. And so N95 masks use a bunch of different clever physics and mechanical tricks to get particles to touch their fibers. First, many spider webs are better than one. Unlike strainers, where stacking many identical ones doesn't improve the filtering at all, more layers of sticky fibers means more chances for particles to get stuck. And how likely particles are to hit or miss a fiber depends in large part on their size. Airborne particles larger than a thousandth of a millimeter basically travel in straight lines because of their inertia. And because there are so many layers of fibers, their straight line paths are essentially guaranteed to hit a fiber and stick. 
airborne particles that are really, really small are so light that collisions with air molecules literally bounce them around, so they move in a random zigzag pattern known as Brownian motion. This zigzagging also makes it super likely that a particle will bump into a fiber and get stuck. Particles of in-between sizes are the hardest to filter. That's because they don't travel in straight lines, and they also don't bounce around randomly. Instead, they're carried along with the air as it flows around fibers, meaning they're likely to get carried past fibers and sneak through even a mask with many layers. But N95 masks have a final trick up their sleeve. They can attract particles of all sizes to them using an electric field. In the presence of an electric field, even neutral particles develop an internal electrical imbalance which attracts them to the source of the field. This is why neutrally charged styrofoam sticks to a cat whose fur has been charged with static electricity. But unlike a cat's fur, an N95 mask's electric field isn't just ordinary static electricity. The fibers are like permanent magnets, but for electricity, electrons. Just like you can permanently magnetize a piece of iron by putting it in a strong enough magnetic field, you can electritize a piece of plastic to give it a permanent electric field. By electritizing the fibers in an N95 mask, they gain a long-lasting ability to attract particles, which means they capture about 10 times as many particles as regular fibers. And this is, after all, the point of an N95 mask, to filter out particles from the air, and they do it cleverly. By taking advantage of the molecular scale stickiness of matter, using many layers of fibers that catch straight moving large particles as well as zigzagging small particles, and having an electric field that attracts all particles, you get a mask, not a strainer, that's really good at trapping both large and small airborne particles, and does a reasonably good job at filtering out middle-sized airborne particles. Precisely what fraction of those sneaky medium-sized particles get blocked gives you the number of the mask. If at least 95% of those particles are filtered out, then the mask is rated N95. Okay, caveats. So N95 masks can be very effective, but if you're... Okay, so we're gonna stop it there because that's the, the physics part is over. But basically, you know, like I said, a lot of that wasn't fluid dynamics, but these tricky middle-sized particles, it's the fluid dynamics that's getting in the way there because they're so hydrodynamic um, that they get carried along with the air really well. And so when they come to a fiber, they just flow around it the same way that air flows around your car as you're driving around the, down the street, right? It's very, you know, hydrodynamically uh, aerodynamic, right? The same way that when we're walking down the street, um, things don't come and stick to our jacket, right? They tend to sort of flow around us, slip around us. So that's the same issue that you have with these middle-sized particles in the N95 mask. So I just think that's really fascinating. So that image right around um, minute 240 um, of this video really talks about those middle-sized particles and how they just slip around the fibers because of the fluid dynamics. All right. So I hope you're back at my slides with me. The last thing I want to say about coronavirus and fluid dynamics is, I don't know if you know this, but we have one of the world's preeminent, uh, you know, uh, virus transmission in air, in aerosols people in the world here at Virginia Tech. Uh, her name is Lindsay Marr and she's in the um, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, and she, you can just read the little blurb here. Most of us had never heard of aerosol science before the pandemic. Then Virginia Tech's Lindsay Marr showed up and became our tour guide to the invisible world of airborne particles. And um, She's doing amazing work. If you know about her work, she's testing different types of masks and gaiters. Recently, there was a controversy saying that gaiters, so these sort of turtleneck masks that you can pull up over your mouth, right, but also cover your neck, showing that they weren't effective. And then she showed, okay, they can be, but it depends on how you wear them and the cloth. Um, she's also done a lot. She was one of the people who convinced the World Health Organization to admit or to say to conclude that um, coronavirus is airborne, right? So what do we mean by airborne? Again, um, there's this sort of false picture of there are particles that we admit when we cough, sneeze, talk, or sing, and some of them are droplets, so they're heavy and they fall to the ground immediately, and that's where the six-foot rule comes from right? That's assuming that we're dealing with these heavy droplets and that they'll fall to the ground before they can reach a distance of six feet. And then there are these other particles that are much smaller that are aerosols. 
and they only are produced in certain circumstances, right? And for a long time, through March, April, May, and even into June, it wasn't known, it wasn't settled whether um, the coronavirus was born in aerosol particles, so very small particles, and it turns out that it is, and Lindsay's one of the people who showed that. Um, and so this brings in questions of air quality, right? If you're indoors, is there enough circulation to clear out these small aerosols that are also containing bits of the virus that are now just circulating in the air and not falling to the floor, right? And Lindsay's also shown that there's not, you know, the simple picture is there are large droplets, small aerosols, but of course there's actually a continuum, right? There's not this nice neat cutoff. But the cutoff that people do talk about is about five micrometers in diameter, right? But that's sort of arbitrary. Okay, how are we doing on time here? All right, so we just check my chats here. Okay. Um, so what are we gonna learn about in this class? Uh, so as I mentioned a couple of times now, I'm gonna try and bring in really relevant biomedical engineering examples in addition to um, all these classical fluid dynamics um, topics, right? So next week we'll start talking about just basic fluid properties like density, um, volume, uh, viscosity, things like that. Uh, then we'll start looking at hydrostatics, right? So that's much easier than when the fluid is moving. If the fluid's at rest, uh, it becomes a much simpler problem to measure the pressure and velocity at points in the fluid. Then we'll look at ways that we measure fluid pressure. Um, we'll look at forces sub on submerged surfaces, buoyancy, Bernoulli equation, and then we're going to move into what's the largest part of the course um, based on the Reynolds transport theorem where we put a control volume around anything we want to analyze, whether it's a pipe fitting or a duct or a piece of an artery, we just sort of take this imaginary control volume and put it around the piece of the system we're interested in and analyze the forces on all of its surfaces. It's a really, really handy tool. Um, that works really well. And so we'll apply uh, control volume theory for the conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, um, and conservation of energy. And then toward the end of the course, we'll look at open channel flows, compressible flows, and turbo machinery. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the course campus site, which is finally up as a very late last night. Thank you for your patience with that. Um, I'm, I want to use all the tools now, you know, when we went online in the spring, I just kind of did a really bare bones version of an online course, but now I just want to use all the cool tools, tools that are available. And so I tried to do that. Um, okay, so this is what the course looks like from the student view. And so the homepage on the Canvas site is the modules, right? So here you can see the week one module. So in this course, we'll have a module for each week. And this is intended to be your one-stop shop, right? You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to go to any external software, um, nothing that you can't reach through inside this module. All of your assignments, all of your reading assignments, so textbook sections, if I wanna show a video, um, I'll put it in there, um, your quizzes, um, your homeworks, um, when you have your video project information, it'll go in there, et cetera. Just every, even the exams will go in there, okay? So when you go to Canvas, just go right to the modules, go to the module for the week that we're on, and you're good to go. Just start working your way through the list. The modules are locked, so you have to complete the previous module before you can access the next one. Just a thing to call your attention to if you haven't had a chance to look over the um, Canvas site yet is that there are three tiny, tiny assignments due this week. Um, one is the syllabus quiz. So just five questions on what's in the syllabus, you know, how many exams are there, that type of thing. Um, one optional assignment on buddy groups. Right, so in this course, I will be breaking you guys up into groups of five. So there's 75 of you, right? So we'll have 15 groups of five. And that's meant to sort of 
create a little bit more of a sort of personal feel in the class, sort of a feeling of social presence, because I really want that to happen. Um, and so maybe if you're stuck on the homework, but it doesn't really warrant, you know, dropping in on office hours, maybe you will um, send a message to one of the people in your buddy group, right? Or FaceTime them, something like that. Just say, hey, you know, what do they, what do you think they mean here? Did you do this problem yet? Something like that, right? These buddy groups are also going to be the teams that you're in for your video project, okay? <laughs> Which I'll talk more about later. The video project is the beloved part of this course that everyone has a great time with. All right, that assignment is optional. You don't have to choose your own group of five, you may. If you decide, hey, let's get these five people together, let's all choose group seven, you know, you can do that. If you don't know anyone in the class, so you don't really care, um, just don't do the assignment and the TA and I will just place you in a group randomly. The third uh, assignment that is due this week, and by this week I mean Sunday at midnight, so the week for this class goes, you know, Monday morning at 12 a.m. in the middle of the night through Sunday at midnight. Um, so the last assignment is the first homework, but it's not a real, you know, it's not a calculation, it's not a computation homework from the textbook where you have to work through a fluid dynamics problem. It is um, part introductory exercise, so it's on Flipgrid and it's a chance for you to just sort of quickly introduce yourself. You don't have to go on camera if you don't want to, um, but just, find a fluid dynamics phenomenon in your life, maybe out and walking out on campus or in your dorm room, in your apartment, find some fluid mechanics phenomenon, either take a short clip of it or take a picture of it and then just make a um, really short recording showing us the phenomenon, saying a couple words about it and uh, just introducing yourself. So I'm actually going to show you mine so you can get a sense of how straightforward this homework is. Oh, but I have to leave student view to do that. There we go. All right, so here is your homework one. As you can see, Flipgrid is integrated into Canvas. And it says, you know, find an example of a fluid mechanics phenomenon around you and record it or take a picture and make a brief video response, okay? So, oh, wonderful, a couple of students have done it already. So here's mine. That's my cat. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Staples. Um, that was Cece, my quarantine kitty, and she was using her paw to break the surface tension and break up a laminar jet in the bathtub. So um, just as simple as that, just a quick introduction. Again, if you're camera shy, don't worry about it. There's a pixelated filter if you want to use that or you don't have to appear on camera. Just, you know, just a little something um, about a, a fluid dynamics phenomenon. Feel free to sort of comment on each other's videos, like them, et cetera. Okay. Back to the modules. Trying to be mindful of time so you guys have uh, time to ask questions at the end. Uh, so that's your homework one. You can see it's the very last thing in this week's module. It took me two minutes to, to do that, to record it. Um, you know, don't overthink it. It's not something that we're gonna be sort of grading harshly. You'll sort of get a participation grade for it. Um, and then the syllabus quiz, just to make sure you read the syllabus. And then the optional um, choosing your own group, right? So what does that look like? Um, I actually better go back into student view here so I don't display anyone's names. Back into modules. And here's the choose a buddy group assignment. Right, so you just, this just takes you to the people tab um, and you click on 
the project groups and this is wonderful. I see people already starting to, to sign up, so that's great. So if you wanna coordinate with a group of friends or acquaintances from the class, just pick a group number, you all go and sign up for that group. Like I said, if you don't care by midnight this Sunday, just don't do it and you'll be assigned into groups. Um, okay. Uh, some important announcements I'll go over in a minute. The syllabus is linked here. It's also over here. Um, the only content from the textbook that you have for this week is optional. And I just selected a couple sections of really brief math skills reviews. So things like units, because that's something that comes up a lot. Uh, you know, even at the junior level, people will be solving a problem and they won't have converted units, you know, from SI to, to British, something like that. Um, so brief math skills just sort of reviews things like units um, and uh, significant figures, right? If you feel good on those things, don't even worry about it. Um, and then brief thermo review as well. Very brief. Um, so the only thing in here that we haven't talked about is important announcements for this first week of class. Uh, so, very important, um, as I'll talk about in a moment when we look at the syllabus, this is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, but there are going to be lectures Monday and Wednesday, and then on Fridays, the TA is going to work out and solve example problems, right? So, it's not quite a flipped classroom experience, but there's going to be a lot of, like, really, really hands-on problem solving in the class. Um, Announcement two, please set your Canvas notifications to notify me right away because I'm not going to be emailing you anymore. I'm just going to be communicating here through the Canvas messaging system. Number three, we just talked about there are two small assignments due this week by midnight on Sunday. Syllabus quiz and that um, Flipgrid homework. And then number four is just that optional buddy group assignment. You can either do that or not. Okay, let us go to the syllabus so we can talk a little bit about how the course is structured. Hey, you do this, maybe you can go straight to taking the syllabus quiz and you won't have to read the syllabus. Okay. So, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, you can follow this Zoom link to reach this lecture that you're currently in. Uh, it does have a passcode for security. It's the same Zoom link every time. It's a recurring appointment, and it's the same Zoom link for the Monday and the Wednesday lecture. I will also drop this link into every module, right? So you don't have to go outside the module to get the link to the Zoom meeting. The Friday meeting in, at the synchronous time, 1.25 to 2.15 is the TA, and he'll be doing that problem solving session. That does not start this week because we haven't covered any course material this week in the lectures. So that's going to begin next Thursday, or next Friday. My office hours are Monday mornings, 9 to 10 a.m. So the TA and I looked carefully at um, what other classes you were taking. We tried to avoid the classes, you know, we tried to avoid having anything at the times when there are a large number of people in another class. So my office hours are 9 a.m. Um, Monday morning, and you can actually sign up for a specific time slot, 15 minute time slot in that hour, right? So if you go here to calendar, there's instructions for how to do it here. But if you go here to calendar um, and then go to the day, go to Monday, you'll see you can sign up for one of four 15 minute time slots. And then you don't have to wait in the waiting room. Um, it'll just be the two of us for that 15 minutes. Uh, graduate office hours start on um, next Thursday. Okay, I'm getting questions about the textbook, which I'll address in just a moment. So uh, graduate um, teaching assistant, oops, got a little typo there, it says teach assistant. <laughs> I'll change that to teaching assistant begins next Thursday. And he's got really heavy coverage um, on Thursday and Friday, and that's because the homeworks are due on Sundays. And so we really wanted to have um, office hour support free at the end of the week. So his Zoom meeting links are here. Again, those are repeat appointments as well. And those will also be dropped into the module. 
prerequisites. I'm sure you already have met, otherwise you wouldn't be in the class. The textbook. Okay, so we are using Mun Munson, Young, and Okishi's Fundamental of Fluid Mechanics, 8th edition. We are using the e-textbook. You do have to purchase access to the e-textbook. It's cheaper than buying the paper, you know, the, the print um, copy of the textbook. And you purchase it by going to the e-textbook link here. Um, and you won't be able to access the materials either there or through the module until you've gone ahead and purchased access um, to, Wiley, to Wiley Plus and to the e-text. So does that answer people's questions? I had gotten a couple of questions in the chat about the uh, textbook. So yeah, basically if you purchase a Wiley Plus code, then you get free, you know, free access to the e-text. It, com it, it comes as a bundle. Unfortunately, I'm not able to provide the textbook chapters. I do link to them here, but I'm not um, able to provide them for free because that would run into copyright issues. Okay, here we have the course description, description and objectives. So by the time you finish this course, you should be able to do this list of five things. So when you're filling out the evaluation at the end of the semester, you know, try to think, did I learn how to do these things? Here I just described the two lectures, one problem solving section. Here I talk about the video projects um, a little bit. And so basically you don't have to think about these until about five weeks into the semester when you'll have a very short proposal due, just a half a, week, half a page long. Okay. Um, and then the video itself is very short, about five minutes and the presentation that you'll be giving at the end of the semester is very short. It's just one PowerPoint slide. But still, this is something that students tend to really enjoy, um, making a video that's appropriate for a high school audience. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because uh, we're running out of time and I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to show you just the, the couple more things that I think are important. Um, are all the homework, someone else is asking, are all the homework going to be done through Wiley Plus? Uh, most of the homework. So homework one, which is due this week, I did it through Flipgrid, which is free, but most of the homeworks for the coming weeks will be through Wiley Plus. Okay, the exams. There are three non-cumulative midterms. There is no final in this class, okay? So once you finish your final midterm on December 2nd, the only thing you have to worry about after that is your video project presentations, and then you're done. Um, I've got a list of important dates. And so the first one is this Friday. There's no class because there are no problems to work through. Um, but then it's got all the dates, you know, when your project proposal is due, et cetera, et cetera. And when it gets closer to that date, I'll give you more information. And then the final three class sessions are just going to be um, the different groups going through the presentation of their video project. Uh, here's the grading scheme. 10% quizzes, 15% homeworks, midterms are 20% each, video projects 15%, and then some language about the honor code and inclusivity. All right, we have two minutes left, so I just wanna open up the floor in case anyone has any questions about the course or anything we talked about today. checking my PowerPoints to make sure I haven't forgotten anything else. I'm going to reshare for a moment. Okay, uh, just resharing to remind you as we part ways that there are two required and one optional mini assignments due this week by Sunday at midnight and that is the syllabus quiz homework one, which is on Flipgrid. It's that little intro video where you show fluids phenomenon. And then if you want to choose your own buddy group, you need to do that this Sunday um, by midnight. All right, do I have any other questions? Doesn't look like it. So I think we can, uh, we can go ahead. It's 2.15. Uh, we've got one more question here. Let's see what it is. 
Oh, do I post the slides? Would you like me to post the slides? And would you like me to post them before or after? Yes, yes, before, before, before. Okay. <laughs> I will post um, a version of the slides before and I'll put them in the module for the week. All right, I think that wraps it up. Um, feel free to message me um, in any way. There's also a chat function here on the Canvas site that you can ask general questions to me and everyone else. Thank you guys very much. I look forward to a good semester and um, we will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend.